Okay. Dear friends, it gives me great pleasure today to uh, welcome my teacher and a friend, Dr. George John. So was uh, my teacher from the time of first year MBBS, like went through MD. And after that, when I was in medicine three with him, he was the head of medicine three. And even since his retirement, constantly I've been trying to get some advice and help from him. Probably the best teacher you can get for critical care anywhere in the world and probably one of the most humble and uh, exciting teachers to listen to. Uh, you'll be inspired hearing his talk. He, he makes complex ideas very simple and he's always waiting for your feedback and trying to make lectures better or more useful. So I'm deeply grateful, sir, that you accepted our invitation to take this lecture series for us. I'm also thankful that you take clinics for our postgraduates even now. We are really honored and grateful to you, sir. Thank you very much. I would urge all the CMC postgraduates to give, sir, the feedback and the faculty, CMC faculty, to give feedback to sir on his lecture after the class. So, sir, we are again deeply grateful. And I'm sure there are so many of your students who are now faculty in various places also who are eagerly waiting for your lectures. It's not only the postgraduates. So, so we are waiting for your academic fees, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Ambo, thank you very much for that introduction. I hope I can live up to the expectations you have put in front of everybody. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> anyway, sir. Let's hope so. Anyway, at the least, even if it's not informative, I hope the lectures will be interesting. Shall I start? Uh, can everybody see the screen? The screen share is okay. Yes, sir. We can see, sir. Okay. So first of all. This is the first of uh, the next eight sessions. And uh, I hope you find it interesting. And I had sent the, this uh, blood gas uh, slides to everybody before. And uh, there's a couple of small errors when I went through it again. I've corrected it. I'll send it back and it'll be redistributed. I'm going to focus on concepts in all these lectures more than uh, just giving information. I, Hope you feedback and if the concepts are not clear, I'll try to make it as clear as is possible. Along with the ABG, I have also sent uh, 20 patients uh, blood gases, real patients blood gases. It's a quiz. The answers have not yet been given. I will give the answers tomorrow afternoon and uh, you can check your answers with the answers I have uh, decided on. And we can discuss it not only tomorrow, but over the next course of the next eight lectures, because ABG is fundamental to critical care. So if you have any doubts over the 20 questions, if there's a discrepancy between yours and my answer, we can hear each other's reasoning and then see what uh, we can learn from it mutually. I've also sent some references, which I hope has been distributed for those who want a little more depth of what they're hearing. And uh, I shall start with the first slide. Now, I can start off by asking you what is the concept of normal, but since this is not a usual clinic, I will start off by saying that uh, generally there are uh, a few concepts of what constitutes normal. Statistically, which most people would respond and say is because if you have a normal distribution curve and you take the mean and two standard deviations, you would have a so-called normal range. But if you take that definition, you would find that anyway, 5% of the people will be permanently abnormal. So that by itself is uh, not a very good definition. It gives you a reference range, yes, where you can get 95% of the population. But to start treating patients at the end of the range of numbers you have, just because it's beyond two standard deviations, is may not always be beneficial. This was well uh, known in the time when uh, diabetes was diagnosed based on blood glucose and the first reference ranges of blood glucose was made depending on this statistical concept. But on follow-up, they found that many of these patients did not develop the macrovascular complications, which meant that uh, although statistically most patients would have a certain range of blood sugars, a little beyond that is not necessarily harmful. 
Therefore, we come to the second definition. Is that an abnormal value in something which reduces your quantity or your quality of life? That's the definition I like because in the ICU, your longitudinal follow-up is not very long. It's not like having a community study. So if a value in the ICU does not increase the mortality or the quality of your care, you could take that as being your acceptable limits. The third definition is whether your therapy causes more harm than good when you cross that limit. Now, this definition, even if you use it, it's not a universal definition because the types of treatment vary with geographical location. So what's available in the US may not be available in India, may not be available in Africa. So that is not a universal definition. And the fourth definition or understanding of what is normal can be easily discarded, which is the plastic surgeon's way of looking at things, what is cosmetically viable. So for the purpose of this lecture, we'll stick to this second definition, the range beyond which it impinges on the quantity or quality of life in the IC. So taking that in mind, we look at the blood gas values. Most textbooks would say pH is 7.35 to 7.45 based on the statistical definition. But for practical purposes, 7.30 to 7.50 does not really alter your outcome in the ICU. And if you try to control it too tightly, you might have side effects of your treatment more than beneficial effects due to the abnormality. So if you're practicing the ICU, this is a good range to keep in mind. But if you're answering an exam paper, I would suggest you go back to 7.35 to 7.45. Similarly for PCO2, 30 to 50 is okay in the ICU. Textbooks and exams say 35 to 45. Partial pressure of oxygen on air, above 80 is fine, by carb 24 to 28. So this is just to emphasize the fact that we're a little more liberal when it comes to the practical aspects regarding the reference range, acceptable ranges for values from the blood gas. But when you do the quiz, stick to the textbook method, textbook ranges, because uh, that is what would be expected to you in any exam. When you actually do a blood gas on a machine, there are certain values which are measured and certain values which are calculated. Now, many blood gas machines will also give you electrolytes, but I'm sticking to the conventional three. The partial pressure of oxygen, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, and the pH. These are measured. The saturation on a blood gas machine is actually calculated, and so is the base excess and the bicarbonate. I'll come to the various uh, finer parts, points of this a bit later down the lecture, either in this or the next lecture. When you get a blood gas slip handed to you, there are two basic points you must note. One is the oxygenation, and the second is the ventilation and the acid base balance. Now, to keep it short, the most important value on the blood gas is the oxygenation. Because the most important organ you're treating in the ICU is not the heart, it is not the lungs, it is the brain. Every other organ strives to keep the brain alive. Without a brain, there is no person. And hypo hypoxic encephalopathy is irreversible. Therefore, all your measures, your blood gas analysis, your monitors, your nursing staff, your doctors are all meant to keep that brain functioning with adequate oxygen. If you fail in that, and the person gets permanent hypoxic brain damage, the ICU has not served its purpose. So I would suggest you first look at the PO2 when you look at the blood gas. Then you can look at the ventilation and acid-based parameters. So this lecture, I shall focus in the same order, oxygenation followed by ventilation and acid-based. Always start with the patient. If you just look at the numbers, they never give you the whole picture. If you do not start off with a clinical scenario, quite often you will find yourself lost in a wilderness of numbers. So what did the patient come with? What type of abnormality is he likely to have? Then look at the numbers. 
And that is a good starting point for ABG analysis. We we'll start with the oxygenation. There are a few concepts. Oxygen enters the airways and the concentration or dose at which it enters is referred to as FiO2. That is fraction of inspired oxygen. Obviously it can vary between 0.21 to one. That is 21% to 100%. Now remember when you refer to FiO2, the F is a fraction. And technically it should be quoted as a fraction. But for bedside communication, a percentage is fine. But for calculations and for papers which you are writing, always refer to, refer to it as a fraction. Then you come to the bottom, you've got the measured partial pressure of oxygen in the blood. And in between, you have a couple of calculated values, which is the PF ratio or the AA gradient, both of which tell you something about how well the lung is transferring oxygen from the airways into the blood. Keep that in mind, we will deal with that in a moment. So you have the fraction of inspired oxygen, which can vary from 0.21 to 1, 0.21 being 21% air, and one being a pure oxygen, 100%. The PaO2, which is measured in the arterial blood gas machine, and a set of calculated values. Now, of course, there are situations where a fraction of inspired oxygen can be go below 21%. For instance, if you are in a burning building and the fire is consuming the oxygen, yes, it will go down below 21%. But for clinical situations, the lowest you can go down to is 21. Now, the dose of oxygen, I'll deal with this in detail in the respiratory lectures, but just to give you a taste of it, oxygen is quite often dosed as flow, that is in liters per minute. But the oxygen concentration is actually a fraction. It tells you how much of that gas mixture is oxygen and how much is not oxygen. And the relationship between the two is not straightforward. It depends on several factors, but just remember that point for the minute. It will be conveyed to you during the course of these lectures. So flow is not the same as concentration. Flow is in liters per minute. Concentration is FiO2. The relationship between the two depends on what is known as a peak inspiratory flow rate. This will be dealt with in detail in the section on respiratory failure, but just remember that it is not the same as minute ventilation. If a person is breathing 500 mils 10 times a minute, your minute ventilation is 5 liters, 500 into 10. But the peak flow depends on the peak flow rate because the person needs oxygen during his inspiratory phase only. During the expiratory phase, which may be twice as long as the inspiratory phase, the oxygen is not going into the lungs. So the peak inspiratory flow rate usually for patients in the ICU is around 30 liters per minute. And using that as an approximation, for every liter per minute added flow, you can add 2.5% to the percentage of oxygen or 0.25 for FiO2. In other words, if a person is getting five liters per minute of oxygen, multiply 0.25 into five and add that to the baseline oxygen from air. So you get that person is breathing about 34%. Now, this is what I have done on an Excel sheet. If you look at the peak inspiratory flow rate, average 30 liters per minute, oxygen flow varies between one to 10. And remember that 30 is made up of pure oxygen and air. So if you are giving one liter of oxygen, he has to take in 29 liters of air to make up the deficit. So the total oxygen he gets is partly from air and partly from the pure oxygen. And you would get 23%. So if you would notice for every liter you add oxygen, your increase is about 2.6%, 2.63. So 2.5 is a good enough number to add on for every liter per minute oxygen at a peak flow rate of 30 liters per minute. So keep that as a number for your routine bedside use, but you will get more insight on this when I discuss peak flow rate with the respiratory series. 
Okay. Now we have got the oxygen in the person. Is the PaO2 adequate? Hypoxia is defined as a partial pressure of oxygen in blood less than 60. That's not good for the brain. Hyperoxia is defined as a PaO2 more than 100. That also does damage. But the damage due to hyperoxia is not as bad as damage due to hypoxia. And remember, your first priority is to maintain cerebral oxygenation. A brain which is deprived of oxygen for more than three to five minutes is for all practical purposes severely and permanently injured. Children may tolerate it longer. Elderly people tolerate it less, but that's a ballpark figure you can keep in mind. So that's the first one, is the PaO2 adequate? You can allow slightly lower PaO2s in patients who are chronically hypoxic, like COPDs and obstructive sleep apnea patients. So having answered that question, the next question is, is oxygen transfer adequate? What is the state of the lungs? For that, you look at the two ratios I mentioned, the PF ratio and the AA gradient. Let's have a look at this. We take a patient who's given an FiO2 of 0.3. That is 30% oxygen, and you've done a blood gas, and the value is 150, and this carbon dioxide is 40. The PF ratio is easy to calculate. You just divide the partial pressure of oxygen in blood by the FiO2. That's 150 by 0.3 is 500. That 500 was a small mistake in the earlier slide. It was given as 300. I've corrected it with this. But for practical purposes, a PF ratio more than 300 implies that the lung parenchyma is okay. The lung is diffusing adequately. Because if you look at it, if a person is breathing air, 20, 21% oxygen, with that PF ratio, he'll be able to get a PAO to more than 60. So that's adequate. But if you look at the PAA, A stands for alveolar oxygen. The lowercase a stands for arterial oxygen. We're looking at the gradient between the alveolar and the arterial. The arterial is measured. The alveolar is calculated. How do we calculate it? PB is the atmospheric pressure. We'll assume it is 760 millimeters of mercury. Now, all these calculations depend on the gases being dry. The water vapor at body temperature of 37 degrees centigrade, the water vapor pressure is 47 millimeters mercury. So you subtract that from 760, you get 713. So that is the way the partial pressure of dry atmospheric air, which is entering the alveolus. You multiply that by the FiO2. Then you will get what is known as the PiO2. That is the partial pressure of inhaled oxygen, inspired oxygen. Now this inspired oxygen at that pressure goes down into the alveolus and a fresh gas is added there. That is the carbon dioxide, which is coming out from the blood and going into the alveolus. That is almost the same as the arterial carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide is highly diffusible. You assume the PaCO2, the alveolar carbon dioxide, is the same as arterial, which is fine. You subtract the PiO2, sorry, the alveolar carbon dioxide from the PiO2. So that gives you 214 minus 40 is 174. So that is the alveolar oxygen. Now, if you look at your blood gas, you have got an arterial oxygen. Subtract the arterial oxygen from the alveolar, you get the gradient. So in this case, it is 24. Normal gradient mentioned is 5 to 10, but ICU patients are not normal. So acceptably in ICU, if it is less than 100, it's okay. I hope that's clear. But as I said before, if you look at the two parameters, there is a difference. The PF ratio does not consider the carbon dioxide at all in its calculation. So looking at the FiO2 and the PaO2, you will get the same value irrespective of the carbon dioxide. The first set of values, the carbon dioxide is rising 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, 120, but the PF ratio remains the same. We are giving 50% oxygen in this case. 
If you look at the second set of values, the PF ratio is again the same. But in spite of the carbon dioxide rising, we're giving 30% oxygen and the person is getting a PO2 of 60. If you were to look at the PAA gradient, that shows a remarkable difference as the carbon dioxide rises because that is part of the equation. So the NEN shell, the PAA gradient is more accurate than the PF ratio if the carbon dioxide is abnormal. Within normal limits, it doesn't make a big difference. It's okay. You can use it practically. But if the carbon dioxide is beyond the normal range of 30 to 50, use the AA gradient. If it is within that normal range, the PF ratio is just as good. And the PF ratio is very easy to calculate at the bedside. The AA gradient, you have to take your calculator or your pencil out and start scribbling on your bit of paper. So for that reason, most intensivist, intensivist loop use the PF ratio as a rapid calculation of the, the ease with which the oxygen is getting transferred from the alveolus onto the blood. Now let's talk about the pulse oximeter, which is a very commonly used device in the ICU. It uses two wavelengths of light, 660 nanometers, which is red, visible red, 950 nanometers infrared. The principle is from physics, if a white light falls on an object, the object appears a color it does not absorb. When you have white light, which is a spectrum of colors falling on an object, the color of the object is decided by the spectrum which it does not absorb. In other words, hemoglobin is red because the Hemoglobin molecule absorbs blue, yellow, green, all the other bits of light. Deoxygenated hemoglobin is not blue, it is red, dark red. Anybody who has drawn venous blood will know this. But the veins appear bluish on the skin because <coughs> deoxygenated hemoglobin absorbs a lot of the red. That's why it's looking darker, unlike oxygenated hemoglobin, which reflects the red. And the blue light is reflected off the walls of the vein. Therefore, the veins under the skin look blue. Now, how does the pulse oximeter detect SpO2, the arterial oxygen? It looks at the absorbance of light at these two wavelengths. Deoxyhemoglobin absorbs greater amounts of red. Oxyhemoglobin absorbs greater amounts of infrared. Using this, it can make out the amount of ox deoxy and oxygenated hemoglobin in the tissues over which it is studying this phenomenon. In addition, it looks at non-pulsatile and pulsatile flow. Pulsatile flow will give you arterial, non-pulsatile flow will be capillary and venous. So using these two parameters, there's an algorithm by which it calculates the amount of oxyhemoglobin, which is what you see as a display on the pulse oximeter. It's one of the most useful devices. This is just to give you a little bit of insight into the functioning of the pulse oximeter because the next slide tells you where it can go wrong. This is the absorption of light of the various types of hemoglobin in the visible red and the infrared region. If you look at the visible red region, the oxyhemoglobin absorption is very poor, which is why it looks red. The absorption is higher it looks darker. That is what happens when you use de deoxygenated hemoglobin, which the absorption is very high for visible red. Infrared, you can't see, only the pulse oximeter probe can sense it. So for us, the visible red is what matters. If you look at carboxyhemoglobin, it's even less absorption of red. So it looks more brighter red than oxyhemoglobin. And the pulse oxygen will give you a false high reading. But if you look at methemoglobin, there's a peculiarity there. Methemoglobin absorbs both in visible red and infrared. So it behaves in a double manner, almost like as if there is oxyhemoglobin and uh, reduced hemoglobin personalities. And because of this, the algorithms are confused and really give you a SPO2 of 85%. 
irrespective of the amount of oxygenated hemoglobin. Therefore, the pulse oximeter is not good when there is methemoglobinemia. But if you have a gap between the saturation on the ABG, which is a calculated value, and the SpO2 on the pulse oximetry, suspect that the person has got methemoglobinemia. And also, if you have high dose vasopressors or severe vasoconstriction, this will affect your transmission oximetry, which is what most of your finger pulse oximeters do, but does not affect if you have the forehead probes, which you can paste on the skin, that's reflectance oximetry. Nail polish can alter readings. It's not affected by anemia. Dark skin can produce discrepancies at lower than 80% SpO2, but this is not an area where we would like patients to be in the ICU. So above 80% gives you very good reading. Some people have started looking at whether you can use the SF ratio instead of the PF ratio, because then you don't need to do a blood gas at all. The only problem with the SF ratio is the hemoglobin has a saturation of 100%. So it is not as good as a PF ratio, but for practical purposes, a PF ratio, we focus on the adult numbers, about 235 SF ratio about 235 corresponds to a PF ratio of 300 and above. And an SF ratio of 235 for a PF ratio of 200, sensitivity and specificity are, sensitivity is lower, specificity is higher. So this is just to keep in mind that your SF ratio is another parameter people can use as a, use as a rapid measure how easily the oxygen is getting across in the lungs. But PF ratio is better and the AA gradient is even better. I hope that gives you a glimpse on what you look at on a blood gas on oxygenation. So at the end of that, you should be able to say, well, is this patient hypoxic? Is the gas transfer across the lungs acceptable? So those are two questions you answer when you look at the ABG quiz as far as oxygenation is concerned. Now to acid-base analysis. The fundamental equation for acid-base analysis is this reversible equation. A carbon dioxide dissolves into water to give you carbonic acid, which dissociates to hydrogen and bicarbonate. The PaCO2 measures the carbon dioxide and the pH measures the hydrogen ion concentration. I need to emphasize this because the pH doesn't have to do with bicarb. It has to do with the concentration of hydrogen ions. The carbon dioxide is controlled by the respiratory system. And if you have Retention of carbon dioxide, you have respiratory acidosis. We have over excretion of carbon dioxide, you have respiratory alkalosis. On this side of the equation, you have metabolic disorders. And unlike a single system on the carbon dioxide side, the metabolic is a conglomeration of tissues. It includes gut, liver, muscle, kidneys, all of which can produce carbon hydrogen ions and the kidneys can control its excretion along with regeneration of bicarbonate. So basically, acid-based disorders are dis divided into two broad groups, respiratory disorders where the primary problem is related to carbon dioxide, either retention or over-excretion, and non-respiratory problems, which is also called metabolic, where the primary problem can be retention of hydrogen ions, over excretion of hydrogen ions, retention of bicarb or over excretion of bicarb, not directly, but because it affects the hydrogen ion concentration. Now it's a fully reversible equation. If you have carbon dioxide concentration goes up on the left of the equation, the equation is pushed towards the right. You have more hydrogen ions and more bicarbonate. If you have an abundance of hydrogen ions, the equation gets pushed towards the left. More carbon dioxide gets re regenerated and you may have to breathe it out to maintain equilibrium. So it's a reversible equation, and the two sides of it, look at it as being controlled by two different organ systems. A couple of terminologies, acidosis and alkalosis refers to the process which tends to decrease or increase pH. Whereas acidemia and alkalemia refers to a pH which has actually become lower or higher than acceptable range. For the quiz, I'm not going to differentiate between the two. We'll keep it simple. We'll take those terms as uh, interchangeable. 
but this is a technical point if you need can keep in mind. A simple acid-base disorder is when only one organ system is dysfunctional. A mixed acid-base disorder is when there more than one organ system is dysfunctional. And the whole of ABG analysis is trying to tease out, is it a single or is it a mixed? And mixed can be double or triple disorders. More of that in the next lecture tomorrow on acid-base. Here we are going to stick to simple disorders. The pH is so important because it affects the activity of enzymes in the body, changes electrolyte distribution and alters drug effects. But remember that we are only measuring the extracellular pH in the blood. We are not measuring the intracellular pH, which is usually not done in standard ice. Keep that in mind. And it's competing forces which trying to keep the pH within acceptable ranges. Now this is known as the hydration. There's some interference in the room. I'm not sure what the reason is. I think somebody is not muted. Hello, wait. Hello. Can you hear me, sir? Okay, carrying on. This is a hydration reaction. Just the presence of carbon dioxide in water tends to cause the generation of carbonic acid, which gives you an acidic pH. So if you actually distill water and leave it on your bench, you will find the pH when you wrap freshly distilled water is seven. You just leave it outside exposed to carbon dioxide in the air, it becomes mildly acidic immediately. So that is just the hydration reaction, nothing to do with any of the body's physiology. So that hydration reaction is also a uh, reaction which uh, depending on the carbon dioxide, partial pressure. But the body has an active mechanism of trying to restore the pH. If there's a problem in the lungs, the kidney tries to restore. There's a problem in any of the organs on the other side of the equation, the lungs try to excrete carbon dioxide and try to get the pH back to normal. These adaptive changes are known as compensatory changes. They're not the same as a hydration reaction. They're actually active processes going on in the body. It does not happen in a test tube. All right. Now, a mixed disorder, as I said, can have more than one organ system. Any combination is possible, except an acute respiratory acidosis and an acute respiratory alkalosis, because you can't obviously breathe faster and slower at the same time. But any other combination is theoretically possible, although practically you may not see many of these uh, combinations. But remember, in theory, any combination is possible, except acute respiratory acidosis and acute respiratory alkalosis. And there are many approaches to evaluating mixed disorders, which I will deal with tomorrow in the part two of this set of lectures. Let us stick to the simple acid-based disorders. In a respiratory acidosis, the primary change is an increase in carbon dioxide. The secondary change would be an increase in hydrogen ion and bicarbonate. Alkalosis, the reverse happens. In a metabolic problem, the addition of hydrogen ions, the loss of bicarb is a primary change, and the PSCO2 change is a secondary change. So keeping that in mind, you can have a respiratory acidosis, a respiratory alkalosis, metabolic acidosis, and a metabolic alkalosis. These are, so to say, the four primary colors of acid-based disturbances. Let us look at respiratory acidosis. First problem is carbon dioxide retention. It can be acute, which just basically means there is not yet time for renal adjustment. So when there's an acute respiratory failure, because there is no time for a renal adjustment, the pH changes beyond the reference range, becomes acidic. But once renal adjustment occurs, the pH creeps back to normal, towards the lower end of the acceptable range. 
causes may be anything from the cerebral cortex coma where the person doesn't breathe to cervical cord injury to peripheral nerve injuries like gillen barre respiratory muscle problems like myasthenia large airway problems like tracheal obstruction to pleural problems which can compress the lungs all of which come under respiratory failure treatment is you treat the cause and if, if necessary you may have to mechanically ventilate the patient respiratory alkalosis is hypocarbia caused by hyperventilation again it can be acute or chronic acute causes may be anxiety for exams cerebral stimulation like in seizures sepsis drugs which can stimulate the central nervous system even hypoxia which can trigger off rapid breathing to maintain oxygenation and as a side effect you can get low carbon dioxide pregnancy progesterone stimulates the respiratory center and gives you a chronic respiratory alkalosis treat the cause for some patients you may have to have a rebreathing back like hysterical hyperventilation now an acute respiratory acidosis as i said changes the ph beyond that range when a chronic does not change that to the acidic range it comes to the lower limit of normal maybe 7.29 7.31 7.32 but it's at the limit of range so that is one way to differentiate acute versus chronic by looking at the numbers but as i said the numbers don't tell the whole story you must have a look at the clinical scenario before you make a decision metabolic disorders metabolic acidosis first of all if you think it's this inconsistent with your clinical picture look if too much heparin has been used in abg syringes especially if they are not prefill syringes prefill syringes have got heparin in a solid form whereas if you use liquid heparin you may have taken too much and heparin is acidic so your blood gas machine doesn't know what you have done it just takes it as metabolic acidosis this is basically divided into increased anion gap and normal anion gap more of this in the second part of the lecture but basic difference is that in the increased anion gap when abnormal ion is coming into the picture keto acids in keto acidosis salicylates and drugs and poisoning whereas in a normal anion gap the basic problem is the loss of bicarbonate or addition of hydrogen again here you treat the cause replace bicarbonate in specific situations and you may have to dialyze the patient in some situations so the dialysis done for the metabolic end of the spectrum like the ventilator does for the respiratory end of the spectrum metabolic alkalosis loss of acid endocrine and it causes electrolyte causes or too much bicarbonate basically you have to replace the volume and correct the potassium and treat the primary cause what about the venous blood gas can you use it as a surrogate for arterial blood gas this is a question where you find it difficult to get an arterial blood gas the central vein is easily available you take that and see the answer in short is not for oxygen but within limits it's okay for ph and for pco2 so you can use it as a surrogate for arterial samples not for assessing ox oxygenation but for assessing the ph and the pco2 it is also useful for adequacy of perfusion i will talk about this more in this section on shock and by the way it can be used for assessing your cardiac output if you have got both the venous and an arterial co2 to give you an example look at this patient if you look at the this is the first is the arterial and the blue is the venous if you look at the ph obviously venous is more acidic slightly more but it is pretty much comparable as i said the ph can be used if we look at the po2 obviously the venous will be much lower pco2 38.5 and 39.9 about 1.5 uh, difference so if the difference is up to 6 the cardiac output is good now look at this patient if you look at the co2 for these two patients one is 15.6 and the venous is 23.7 the difference is huge this person has got a low cardiac output i'll come to the exact way this is done later but just keep that in mind if you do a venous blood gas if you have a concomitant arterial blood gas and you compare the carbon dioxide it helps you to evaluate cardiac output 
that's it for today. Any questions, feel free to ask. I've tried to keep this within 30 minutes so that you have time for questions. And if you can't ask today, you're free to ask tomorrow. Please go ahead and do the ABG quiz that will sort of answer all these concepts. Audio, audio. Hello, sir. Uh, so thank you, sir. That was that was simplified. Am I audible, sir? Yes, you are audible. Uh, so there was a question. I think you just answered that. Uh, there's a question from uh, uh, the group uh, asking, sir, what's the evidence for using VBG for assessing a patient's metabolic status in an ICU or a critical care setting? I hope I've answered that question. Yeah, that was prior to that. Yeah, okay, that's hope. good. That's good people are thinking when the lecture is going on. Yeah. Any further questions? And by the way, the VBG should be a central venous blood gas, not a, from your hand. Or not a peripheral. Sure. Any further questions, please uh, feel free. We'll wait maybe another two minutes to see no, if anyone fine. has the to. Questions may come up later while they're doing the blood gas questions also. That is fine. Tomorrow yeah. is fine. Anytime during the next minute, it's also uh, there will be a feedback form sent to all of uh, all the medical uh, medicine CMC medicine faculty and including the PGs. It will be mandatory for PGs to uh, feedback give a feedback on today's lecture so that we can improvise further. You can wait for five minutes. People may be still thinking. Yeah, sure. Sir. The ones who are sleeping may be waking up. <laughs> so the uh, quest the quiz is totally on today's lecture or is it including tomorrow's? No, the quiz includes both the lectures together. There is no harm in attempting it today, getting the answers and redoing it tomorrow and seeing how the answers change. It's a self-learning process. I'm not going to mark it. I'm just going to give all the answers at the end of tomorrow's lecture. You can correct it yourself. Come back with more questions. During the respiratory session, during the soft, soft session, whatever. It's fine. <laughs> Uh, so there was one more question. Sure. Um, so can we assess perfusion by hydration status based on an ABG, VBG, example, a high lactate? Yes. yes. You can. I haven't come to that because that is the section on shock. So I will deal with that in detail in the section on shock. Because so for rest it is not just a function of perfusion. It is also a function of oxygen delivery. So if your hemoglobin is very low, your oxygen delivery also will be low. Your lactate may be high. Maybe your perfusion is good. So the question is a good question. Keep it hanging till the section on shock. So I think uh, the rest of the crowd outside CMC is ignorant about the upcoming lectures. So we'll have lectures by sir on uh, coming Fridays and Saturdays. Uh, it's for uh, five to six p uh, three to four p.m. on Fridays and twelve to one p.m. Uh, those are the coming lectures will be on uh, next tomorrow will be on mixed acid based abnormalities. Then we have it on respiratory physiology and respiratory failure for next Friday, Saturday. And then we have it on uh, cardiovascular and shock. Then we have renal and neurological support in the critically ill patients. So we have eight upcoming lectures from Sir, hopefully covering uh, the basic aspects of all critical care. So to just answer that in brief, high lactate does not necessarily mean that the perfusion is poor. It definitely means that the tissues are not getting enough oxygen. Or there's a cellular uh, poison, which is, for example, in thiamine deficiency, lactate may be high. It may have nothing to do with perfusion. So we will look at the physiology of it in the section in shock. So there's one more question. So how different can be the peripheral venous pH from the arterial pH? How different? It, it, it is, as I said, if you actually look at the slide uh, I given, you've got a range there. You look at that. The mean difference between pH is 0 0.036 between arterial and venous. And the 95% confidence interval is 0 0.03 to 0 0.042. The answer is that. I mean, these slides are free to share. Please give it to whoever you want. But I'm sending it. So there's a small correction in one of the slides on this. So I'm sending you the corrected uh, set in an hour or so. So please share it. And that, I hope, answers the question. That is the difference in pH. 
Sure. So there was a request from the crowd asking his questionnaire available for non CMC PGs. I have no problem. Please give it to everybody. Sure. Sir. And uh, the they can be sure. Uh, please provide your mail IDs to the then link has a uh, email ID mentioned as met to at CMC value dot AC dot in. Please forward your mails on that and we'll subsequently forward the uh, presentations and question questionnaires to that email ID. It's anonymous and be frank. Yeah, sure. So there's one question. Uh, the A gradient value that the machine gives is accurate or is there is a caveat to the machine value? No, the machine, if it is cal cal calculated, it should be correct. Okay, so there's one more question. The, with respect to the previous question asked with, uh, regarding the difference between peripheral venous pH and arterial pH, uh, they would like to know if it's supposed to be the difference between peripheral venous pH and central venous pH. No. If it is. It never use the peripheral venous pH. Always, when you refer to venous pH, it is the central venous pH. Because if you were to look, take up my pH from your, my, uh, my hand, I'm, it's only coming back from my finger muscles. If I take it from my elbow, it includes all the base products from my forearm muscles. If I take it from my leg, so it'll all be different in which peripheral vein you're sampling. So it's such a wide disparity that a peripheral venous pH is not possible. You have to use a central venous pH. Hello? There's one now. Uh... Person had uh, raised a hand, Mr. B. H. Tron. Do you have any questions? Means you can unmute, unmute yourself. Sorry. No, one uh, one person in the crowd had raised a hand, uh -huh. wanting to ask a question. So yeah. either please type down the question or can unmute yourself and then yeah, raise sure. the question. Yeah, sure, please. To have any questions, I think. Any other questions? Uh, so the email is met to at cmc value dot ac dot i, and the crowd has requested for the email ID for accessing yeah, the. Please, go ahead and, uh, uh, what about the person who raised the hand? What about that question? I think that's by mistake, sir. <laughs> Oh, mistake. Okay. The message so, saying no question. Ask. You can even ask tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, please feel free to ask the on the prior lectures also. You can ask from a, any past lecture at any session in the future. Mm -hmm. And as I said, a couple of things about lactate, I will deal with that as it comes along because it needs a little more understanding of what is happening at the tissue level. But it will be dealt with in one of the come upcoming lectures. And all slides will be given in advance so that you can go through it before the lecture. For instance, the respiratory slides, I'm going to send it over on Monday. And it can be distributed. So just the just nice please use the central venous area. You can use the central venous area as an absolute, not a perfect venous area. Sure, sir. So there's a question. Uh, so when should one use AA gradient at the bedside instead of PF ratio? When the CO2 is out of range. If the CO2 is above 50 or less than 30, I would look at the AA gradient. Out of range CO2s, your A gradient cannot be that accurate. Sure, sir. Just think of this as continuous eight sessions with uh, large uh, gaps in between for you to think and ask. And feel free to ask. Don't think any question is stupid. 
or not good to ask please ask whatever comes to your mind and as i said methemoglobin and pulse oximeter newer pulse oximeters have three wavelengths of light so they are more expensive but they can detect methemoglobin also but the standard pulse oximeter we use at the bedside is inaccurate for carboxyhemoglobin and methemoglobin I can't see anybody. Is there any uh, queries or chats or anything? Uh, anyway, take time to absorb it. Please come back with any questions you may have tomorrow. Tomorrow timing is twelve. Right. There's one more question, sir. Are uh, forehead reflectance oximetry devices commonly used? Yeah, on the for in fact, many children they use it. It's the one you stick you stick onto the forehead in kids. And most of them are disposable varieties because you don't re-sterilize it. You stick it onto the forehead, and uh, it's reflectance uh, oximetry, and uh, it is uh, slightly more expensive because the, that the probe has to be discarded after one use. You can't stick it on somebody else's head. It can't be sterilized. But it uh, helps you in the case of shock, where the periphery can be either because of shock or because they're using a lot of energy. Uh, so one more question: Is there a standard grading for A gradient like PF ratio? I said that in that slide. What happened to my slides? I'm seeing everybody here. <laughs> Maybe so you have to share again. It's not seen. Not seen. Okay, share again, huh? Share again, sir. Okay, here we go. Yeah, it's in the green at the bottom. Normal is five to ten. ICU less than hundred. Okay, sure. I hope that answered the question. And one more question: How does methemoglobinemia cause low SpO two? Yep. Yeah, again, back to the slide. Some of these people have joined later. Here's methemoglobin absorption curve. As I said, anything is because it does not absorb the red. Light. Methemoglobin absorbs both visible red and infrared. So basically, it confuses the algorithm in the pulse oximeter, and it shows a fixed SpO2 of 85%. Because normally the pulse oximeter algorithms distinguish between oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin by looking at the variable absorption at visible red and infrared. Methemoglobin has two hats. It wears the oxyhemoglobin hat and the deoxyhemoglobin hat. So the pulse oximeter doesn't know what to make of it. And it settles for 85%. So if the actual PO2 is lower than uh, 85% it shows higher. If it is actually higher, it shows higher. Just keep checking. Any questions? I hope that uh, is clear. If it is not, I can explain it further. Basically, the algorithms are designed on the variable absorption of visible and infrared light. Methemoglobin does uh, both. So the pulse optimator cannot differentiate based on its uh, parameters which is given to its algorithm. Hello, are we still around? Yes, sir, I think uh, the slide one, <laughs> the one slide before that, so that might also make it more clear. The one, uh, yes, sir. Please distribute the slides to everybody. Yes, sir. Oh, that I think. Put it on your server and they can download it instead of distributing it's it. It's clear, sir. They, the person who asked the question replied saying it's clear now. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. That's good. The greatest thing is somebody who teaches can get is say, aha, now I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> <all> <laughs>
coming sir there uh, sir anything more yes, sir, to add yes, on sir, sir? Yes, sir no no i think sir we'll wind up for today then yep back tomorrow oh, thank you very much sir oh welcome i enjoyed it so tomorrow 12 o'clock sir yep okay sir we'll see you then sir see you thank you very much for the opportunity no sir thank you so much sir thank you again bye see you thanks, tomorrow thanks anju okay sir bye sir bye bye